Elliot McGraw here again. I'm the Community and Cultural Education Director for the Friends of the Richfield National Wildlife Refuge, and I'm super excited to welcome you to our special presentation today. First off, we have Peter Bauer from Portland Rewild teaching us about ancestral technologies as far as fire starting. It was very pleasing to have Peter in the house with us this morning. He started the fires for us, so we were honoring the plank house all day today with warm fire. Additionally, you should check out Peter and his work with rewilding. It's not a conservation movement. It's something completely different, and I encourage you to explore what he's doing. He is very faithful in his indigenous partnerships, as well as the impact he has on his community around him. So you can check out their offices near Cathedral Park or just find them on Facebook. Our featured presenter today is Joshua Hood, a Yaki and Modoc bow maker and archer. He's got so much information to share today and it's amazing. We've got three part series from him. First, he's gonna introduce us to a number of his handmade bows techniques and what they can typically be used for. And I'm definitely excited for the second segment because my child Josephine helps him demonstrate not one, but three different drawing techniques. And finally, uh, he joins us inside by the fires in the plank house, and he's gonna bang out a fully functional bow in just a matter of minutes, and we get to watch. So I definitely had fun filming all these, and I'm excited for you to get to see these presentations today. Hi, my name is Peter. I'm the director of Rewild Portland, and today I'm gonna be talking about fire by friction using the bow drill method. So fire by friction, um, is an ancestral technology as well as a survival skill. And it's one of the things I like to talk about the most when I'm teaching this particular skill is the difference between an ancestral technology and a survival skill. Because oftentimes you see on television these days in particular, these things that are billed as survival television shows when really oftentimes what they're doing is ancestral skills. And if you were to do that in an actual survival context, you might die. <laughs> so it's a really important thing to keep in mind. A lot of the shows that you see on TV are actually more like infotainment, not education. Um, and I would not particularly do anything that you see done on a television show. I would definitely actually do some research and go to some schools and learn from some educators on what the difference between a survival skill and an ancestral skill is. Um, Ancestral technology is basically the kinds of technologies that any living culture would have available to it at most of the time. Um, what that means is that uh, there was no urgency the way that there is in a survival context. So in a survival context, what you have is an immediate need to either make it back to your culture or back to a familiar environment where you know where your food, water, shelter, and community is. Um, so even in a, oftentimes we hear that hunter-gatherers or um, ancient people or even people today that still live as hunter-gatherers that they are in a survival situation or that they're surviving. That's actually not true. Um, most of those people have cultural practices in place to get all of their needs met without suffering, without that sense of urgency that you have in a survival context. The reason why bow drill is um, an overlap is because if you were in an unfamiliar environment, which would be a survival context, and you needed to make fire urgently in order to survive, like for example, overnight um, extreme temperatures, then you could potentially make a bow drill from scratch, um, which makes it then both a survival skill and an ancestral skill, because in an ancestral skill culture, you would just have these kinds of things readily available when you needed them. You wouldn't have to make them from scratch. However, you can. Um, so there's a lot of different technologies that have that overlap, and the bow drill is one of those. One of the biggest ones that um, you're going to be learning about today also is bow making. Bow making is more of an ancestral technology than a survival skill, because in a survival situation, most likely you're going to be rescued within two weeks. Um, in that case, you're not going to need to make a bow and hunt your food. You probably just won't eat. <laughs> um, so those kinds of things, the things that take a lot longer of time, those are generally the things that you would think of as more of an ancestral technology. Um, so the bow drill gets its name by the bow, and it's different than a bow, like bow and arrow. You can see there's not tension on this cord the way there is with a bow and arrow. I'm not going to be shooting anything out of here. There is a tension set on, on the cord itself, but that tension is specifically to wrap around um, what's called the spindle, and that makes it hold it in place, and then it's strong enough, it's tight enough around it that when I move the bow back and forth, um, the spindle will actually rotate as I move the bow. 
Um, but I want it tight enough that if I do let go, it spins out. Um, and then I know for a fact that it's tight enough to actually rotate the spindle as I'm drilling. So the bow drill isn't just a fire by friction technique as well. It's also just a drill. And you see this technique used all over the world um, as a fire starter, as well as um, drilling things like holes in beads and shells and stuff like that, um, or even just holes in wood. Here today, I'm using um, two different kinds of wood. So I have my drill bit here, and this is actually made out of sage. Um, and sage is a very, very flammable, dry, porous material that just loves to ignite into flame quite easily. Um, and so I've chosen easy materials so that I know that I will get a fire. <laughs> um, if I were to choose harder materials, I might actually uh, maybe build up some of my muscles, uh, but I might actually use that skill in a context where I'm removed from my environment. But if I'm in my environment and I know where porous dry wood is, that's what I'm gonna go to first. So I've got a cedar board here for my hearth board, and I've got um, some sage here for my spindle. So you can kind of see here on the board that there's a, a hole that's already drilled and a little like slice of pie. What happens when you're drilling is that essentially it would be if, like if you were to rub your hands together forever and ever and ever, eventually your skin's gonna start wearing, sloughing off, right? Because matter has to go somewhere. It's the same when you're grinding two pieces of wood together. Basically what happens is you're generating wood dust and you wanna concentrate and funnel all of that wood dust into one place. And so what this here is, is essentially a funnel that not only funnels all of the wood dust that you're generating, but all of the heat that you're generating as well. And when that heat from the friction gets to a certain temperature, it ignites into a spark and sends the spark into the powder that you've created, into that dust from the grinding of material together. And that little spark will land in that dust and start to ignite the dust and grow into a glowing ember. And then we'll take that ember, place it in our tinder bundle, um, and breathe on it, and that will catch on fire. It's important to make the tinder bundle before you start doing any drilling. If you forget to make your tinder bundle, it would be like a robin forgetting to make its nest before laying an egg. <laughs> it's just gonna fall out of the tree and land on the ground. Um, in the same way, we wanna make sure that we have our, our little fire nest here for our fire baby or fire egg. And then we wanna have a space ready to put this when that catches on fire into the next stage as well. So we have a series of things over here. So while we're gonna just get a spark with the bow drill, in order to actually get a fire going, we have to go through a couple more stages where we progress in size between wood. So we start out with fluffy stuff, go to a little bit bigger stuff, a little bit bigger, and then we have a bigger pile here. And I'll be able to move these things onto this pile in the center. So um, I also wanna have a platform here to catch all the powder and the coal. Um, a lot of times you'll see people put their little tinder bundle underneath their, their fireboard like this. You see that in a lot of those survival books. Again, that's one of those things where for trial and error, I would suggest just having a platform. If you have something like this underneath there, it can smother it and not get enough oxygen. Because when that spark comes out, uh, you know, fire needs three things. It needs fuel, heat, and oxygen. So if you're not getting it any oxygen, it's not going to ignite. And I find when people put that tinder bundle underneath, that can end up um, suffocating fire before it gets to really breathe much. So I like a platform. I like to also have it off the ground. Even if the ground is dry, I will still have a platform because there might be some kind of moisture in the ground, even if it's like rock. Um, and also if I do this on a platform, then once my coal is ready, I can actually lift up the platform and move the coal if I need to. So with the bow, the bow is um, one of the most crucial elements to the bow drill, obviously it gives it its name, but I like to choose a bow that is the full length of my arm from sort of the inside of my armpit all the way to my fingertips. So this bow is almost an inch or two short, but that's okay, it's just long enough for me. Um, and that's because I wanna really be able to fully extend my arm and what that will do will, every time the, the bow has to stop to go the other direction, you're losing heat because the friction stops. So the longer the bow, the longer the time you have for the amount of friction that you're generating. So if you have a really short bow, you're gonna have to stop a whole bunch because you're gonna have to be moving back and forth. And every time you're stopping, you're losing that heat. 
So a longer bow gives you longer strokes, allows that heat to maintain a little bit longer. That will get you a fire faster. The other thing is you want it to be a little bit of a bow shape. You can use a straight piece if you're using, um, if your cord is made out of like leather, this is a buckskin cord. So this is made out of uh, brain tan deer hide and uh, it's just reverse wrapped. It's one of my favorite materials, uh, natural materials to get a bow drill coal with. You can also use fiber plants. If you use fiber cordage, you need a green bow that's alive um, so that it will bend. Because what happens is when you, uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't have flexibility the way that leather does. So plant fibers will break if you put a lot of tension on or torque on them, whereas the leather will stretch, similar to um, parachute cord, which a lot of people use for these as well. It has a little bit of a stretch in it, whereas the plant fibers don't stretch. Um, so then I have just a little bit of extra back here. If it breaks, I can relace it and uh, have a little bit more length and a little bit more time on this. Um, but I've got it tied on both ends. And then of course, I need something to hold the spindle on the top. And I really like um, using multiple mediums in nature to create these kind of tools. You could use wood for the top. You could use you know, bark for, or fiber, plant fiber for the cord. But I like to be able to um, combine animal and wood together to kind of create this mosaic of natural materials. And you can kind of see the interwoven, um, you know, whatever, the, the interwovenness of all of the different elements of nature. Sometimes I use a stone handle as well. So then I've got stone, animal hide, and wood. So once I have my main five parts or six parts, I've got the handle, the bow, the string, the fireboard, the spindle, the tinder bundle, and this little platform. Um, I need to make sure that the parts are all working well together. And one of the best things here is to just make sure that your spindle is really straight. It's gonna be long enough. I like to do a thumb to pinky, but you know everybody's hand's a different size, so that's gonna change depending on who the person is. Um, but you want this as straight as possible and as round as possible. If this is square or oval, it's not gonna spin really well in the socket down here um, on the board. So you want this to be able to go in and spin pretty easily. And the same thing is true of the top. So the reason why I have this carved into a finer point here, and this is more of a blunt point, is that the more surface area you have, the more friction that you have. So if we reduce the surface area on the top, we'll have less friction on the top. If we increase the surface area on the bottom, we have more friction on the bottom, which is where we're drilling. We don't want friction on the top because then we're doing twice as much drilling and we're gonna exhaust ourselves before we're actually able to get a fire. So by carving this into a really fine point, we reduce the friction on the top. You can also see this is kind of shiny up there. That's great, that's glaze. So it's getting really polished. And that again, that means it's smooth. So it's gonna be more uh, frictionless. And I want less friction in the top. You can also see the inside of this is very polished too. And this is a cool bone. This is um, the astragalus bone from a cow. Uh, an elk would be a little bit larger than this and maybe more traditional in that sense. But one of the cool things about this bone tool is that it doesn't have to be modified at all. So this tool in and of itself is something you could just find on the ground in the forest floor and you don't have to alter it. You don't have to hit it with another rock or shape it or anything like that. It's already got this awesome natural shape that fits really nice in the palm. And then it even has like a little finger grip right there where the groove is. And on a cow or elk or a deer, this would be essentially in their ankle and it's called the astragalus bone. So I'm gonna go ahead and start drilling. I'm gonna now show you the proper form. So once I get the spindle in, I wanna kinda of create a, um, what I like to say is a square with my legs where my shin goes straight up, my thigh goes um, you know, parallel to the earth, and then my back leg is parallel to my front shin here. So it kinda of creates a square with the last part of the square being the earth itself, or the hearth in this instance. Um, and then I want to make sure that when I put my foot on the board that my ankle is really close to this hole because I'm going to essentially glue my arm or, or freeze my arm to my shin in order for stability. So I'm not out here wobbling around. 
I want stability, I'm gonna hold it right against my leg and it almost becomes like a, a miniature cane that I'm leaning on with this arm and then bracing um, with my shin. I'm gonna try to turn a little bit so you can get a little bit more of the light in there. So now, if you notice, I'm just, um, my posture is I'm up above and this arm is almost perfectly straight. I'm not down here like this. There's no angle here. If I'm angled here, that means that the majority of the pressure that I'm pushing down here is coming from my forearm. But if I come up like this, it's, there's no muscles really being activated at all other than to just hold my arm straight. And if I want to apply more downward pressure, I just lean forward on this like a cane. And that way I'm not really exhausting my muscles in this, in this position. And I can control how much pressure I'm applying by leaning forward or leaning back. Then I'm gonna gather the material up with my hand here, this extra cord, and I'm gonna add this little extra bonus here where I put my thumb on the cord and I can control the tension of the cord. If it's too loose, I can push it out and tighten it. If it's too tight, I can let it in. So this way I have total sort of flexibility as I'm drilling to kind of feel out and troubleshoot my way through this. And then if you notice, I'm holding the very back of the bow. I'm not holding it in the middle, not holding it in the front. I'm holding it all the way in the very back. And again, that's so that I get a full stroke all the way from the tip, all the way to the back, all the way to the tip, all the way to the back. And again, that's because every single time you stop spinning to go back one direction or the other, you're stopping your friction. You're gonna lose heat. So you wanna make sure that you're using the full length of the bow. And this is what it should sound like when you're drilling. It's kind of that sort of smooth. Sometimes you hear squeaking. That usually means that the spindle is rubbing against the side wall of the socket down below. So you might need to carve the socket a little bit bigger or you're getting too much friction in the top. And as you can see, the little notch there is filling up with powder and smoke. <laughs> and once I drill it for a while, I can kind of see smoke billowing out of that powder pile in a different way. It's almost more like a chimney fire. See that, that smooth smoke coming out of there? That's when you know you have a coal. It looks kind of like a chimney. It's got that sort of like creamy sort of look of a smoke instead of billowing out. Oh, you can start to see it glowing red. I like to fan it with my hand. It's kind of like, you know, sometimes when babies come out and they don't breathe yet, you gotta kind of spank it, <laughs> get it to cry and start breathing. It's sort of like that. <laughs> get that fire to breathe. If I were to blow on it, that would be too much. So I just wanna drift my hand back and forth. And what I'm doing is kind of letting that coal grow and pretty big and robust. And it's nice, there's not a lot of wind in here. <laughs> Sometimes on a windy day, all of that could just get blown away. So you, maybe you're you know, trying to hold the, the position of your body or other pieces of wood. Once that coal's big enough, you've got your tinder bundle. So you can just grab your tinder bundle, kind of make sure it's a little bit nesty like that. There's like three coals in here. <laughs> And then again, because I have it on this platform, I can just lift it, tap it. It does not want to go, there we go. And uh, it's kind of stuck to the board. It burned a little bit into the board. Here we go. Give it a little. And now what I'm gonna do is wave it back and forth. And this is important for hypnotizing all of the people watching you do this. <laughs> Um, now, th what this does is it, it dries out all the atmospheric moisture that's collected in this fiber. Um, it's basically, you, if you think about this like a micro forest fire, 
forest fires will smolder for a while and burn. In the meantime, they're like drying up all of the, all of the fuel above them. And then when that fuel is primed and dry, a forest fire can rip up a hillside, you know, at 30 miles an hour or more. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm just priming this tinder bundle for that moment. This heat is being generated. You can see as I fan this, it gets a little hot and red in there. Every time it does that, it's drying it out just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And at that point, I know that when I start to feel the heat in my hand, I know that this is kind of hot. I can almost feel like the sweat a little bit in between my fingers. And I know it's probably ready to go. And then at that point, what I do is I just go ahead and blow on it. And you've got a flame there and you can put it on your fire bed <laughs> and add your little fuel. And that's how you start a fire with a bow drill. <laughs> uh, Rewild Portland hosts a week-long ancestral skills gathering every summer. And if you're interested in coming, you can learn all about friction fire. You can learn about uh, basket weaving, hide tanning, bow making, arrow making. A lot of the skills that we do here at Traditional Technologies Day are present there as well. Um, if you're interested in that, you can check out our website, rewildportland.com or echoesintime.com. It's a family-friendly week-long camping trip where you get to learn all kinds of ancestral skills. So it's super cool. It's been going for about over 20 years now. And uh, yeah, I hope to see some of you there. Wakalicia Gawasasas Joshua Hood. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, they, them. And my tribes are Modoc and Pasquayaki. I am a traditional bow maker and I've been making bows for I would say close to eight years. I've been teaching archery for how to shoot um, for over a decade and yeah I've been teaching bow making classes and passing this tradition of making our, um, our sacred tools for about seven to six years. So going on seven. Um, yeah um, it is been blessed that I have been given the gift to be able to make these things and be able to pass them on to teaching our youth and outreach to our communities because um, for a long time uh, I've been kind of isolated as uh, a native bow maker um, here in Oregon as like one of the only bow makers where I don't know if that's exactly true, but I also want to get rid of that stereotype that we are a dying breed of people. We are still here. We are strong. We are resilient and we are taking our power back. And this is one of the ways that I take our power. I'm helping our communities um, build resilience as a people. So stay tuned for the bow and tell. <laughs> here I have a lot of bows and uh, a hand set of arrows that I'll be doing what's called a bow and tell. Um, and it's sound, it's going to be exactly what it sounds like. Uh, just kind of giving a brief description of each one, um, relating it to the land, um, the harvest, and kind of like maybe a time period of when I made it. And we'll see how it goes. So um, yeah, we'll just start going down the list. This right here um, is not a completed bow. Um, I wanted to start with this just to show some folks basically kind of what some of the more traditional bows look like in this area. For many, many tribes, we have Pacific Yew, which is the heartwood, on the belly. And then on the back of the bow, right here, which is the part of the bow that is facing away from you when you are shooting, is layered with elk sinew um, and hide glue. So this is actually still curing. And be curing for another few months. Generally they cure anywhere from six months to a year. Um, 
So you can see that there was a lot of investment when people were harvesting these um, these materials for you know for a live for their living. So um, a lot of patience was needed when making these things because uh, to invest in a tool that's going to provide protection and hunting for a year is a very long time. So. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to move down and show you some completed ones that are similar to this. This right here is also Pacific U. Um, this is the heartwood. This white creamy layer right here is the sapwood. And then you have also elk sinew on the back of this bow. And this actually I painted with natural pigments. Um, I think it was just pine, charcoal, and then red ochre. And then for the string, traditionally the strings were made out of like sinew or rawhide or some plant-based fibers like uh, like dogbane and stinging nettle and things like that. Um, here I'm just using 100% um, wax polyester. Um, so because I don't, I'm not super duper good at cordage yet, but it's very difficult to make a bowstring um, naturally, so we're getting there. Um, I have the rabbit fur silencers on here to dull the noise of the twang when you release the arrow. Um, the string, when you let go, goes like this after you've shot and released your arrow. So by putting these string silencers on here, it dulls that twang noise. Um, hence why it's called the silencer. And I only put these on bows that I hunt with. I'm not really worried about people or myself hearing a little bit of a reverb of the noise of the string, but I don't want the animals to hear that noise after I've released an arrow um, trying to harvest them. So anyway, uh, one of the, this is my first bow that I've made uh, that has been sinew backed and out of you. So I was very honored to make this. My people made this. Um, I put on my mode oxide, and many people up in the Pacific Northwest and on this land have used Pacific U as a traditional hunting tool um, for bows and other different tools like adzes and stuff like that too. It's really cool. So we can see, I'm going to move on to our next one. This is also Pacific U. You can actually see a little bit of a color difference. Um, there, not all woods are, you know, uh, have the same hue and that color. Um, this one is also sinew backed, but I put a gopher snake over the top and you can see the sinew. I left that on purpose so people knew that underneath the snake skins it's sinew backed. And this one is a little different as you can tell from this first one. So this one has a straight limb, right? There's no kick on the end where this one right here has been steamed which is a traditional uh, way of um, enhancing the performance of the bow is by recurving the end of the bow. And so I know that people here before use steam boxes a lot. Um, we bent a lot of things to make canoes, um, kayaks, boats, and things, all kinds of things were getting steam bent. Um, why, why not stick your, the tip of your bow in there, bend it to get a little bit more performance? Add in the recurve in there allows for the drop the bow to be drawn a little bit further um, for a shorter limb bow, and it also increases the feet per second of the arrow, so the arrow goes a bit faster, which is really good. You want that, so your animals not like what was that noise, and then boom, it hits. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, moving on, we have another piece of Pacific U. Um, this one I was honored to make for the Duwamish tribe of Seattle. Um, they are, um, like most tribes, you know, honoring the, um, the resilience and the comeback of, you know, a lot of our traditions and a lot of our tools. Um, so I was able to, someone reached out to me from their, um, their longhouse up there to make a, um, I don't want to call it a replica, but just like a redesign of what they were using. And this is only like 36 inches. Um, but these bows were meant for hunting in dense brush areas as well as on boats for hunting um, different type of large fish or whales. And we have sturgeon, which is a, um, a fish, a very large ancient fish, uh, on the back of this. This is also sinew backed, so there's a layer of 
the elk tendons underneath here with hide glue, and then you have the beautiful Pacific U heartwood. And there's even a knot right here, and it looks really cool. <laughs> yeah. And then this actual string is made out of sinew from elk. It's one of my first goes on it that didn't snap. <laughs> but it's a lot different than what the other strings look like. And it's got that cool white, um, very nice. Oh, and this handle is actually dogbane cordage. Um, dogbane is a type of plant that grows here and the, the rope is very strong and it's rot resistant. So that's why a lot of people in this climate would use it because it wouldn't rot or break um, when it got wet, which is good. Sweet. Moving on. Uh, this is the last Pacific U bow that I'll show you. This one is like a very more like modern day. It's very long. Uh, most bows are a lot shorter for the region. Um, most, but you wouldn't really find any bows in this area or on the west coast this long um, that I am aware of. And yeah, this is Pacific U. This has sturgeon on the back as well. Um, these buttons are a lot bigger on here because on this one, I just use the very side of the sturgeon. I actually use, or this is the direct side of the sturgeon. This one's just a very clip, a uh, small clipping of it. So, yeah. And these are called like the buttons or there's a, a couple other names for them, but I just call them the buttons. <laughs> and yeah, this one is definitely used for hunting. This one has something different than the others. This has what's called a tip overlay. And I just glued um, some koa wood, actually it's from Hawaii, because <laughs> um, it's pretty on the tip of this bow. Yeah, and then string silencers to dull the sound. Sweet. And then the way that people would um, put the skins on the bow is either hide glue or fish bladder glue, something like that. I would imagine for, you know, people who are doing like whale hunting and stuff, um, they would use some type of fish glue because it's water resilient um, and like waterproof, where like hide glue, it kind of gets nasty. <laughs> I like to think of bows as people. Um, Whenever I string them, meaning, I'll just show you how to string a bow really quick. Stringing the bow just means getting the top loop of the bow string up to the knock. So this is stringing a bow. And so now that it's strung, like I never wanna just go ahead and pull it like full draw, like these are people. So you need to honor them like that too and give them a small warm up before you actually start pulling them all the way. Right, just like you would give yourself a little bit of a warm up before you exercise, you're exercising the bow every time you pull the string. So, when you're done using them or you're not using them, they're under a lot of tension and compression. So, if you're not using them, you know, honor them by unstringing them every time. That's how I do it. You can leave them strung for like, you know, a duration of a long hunt. Like, let's say you're hunting all day, leave them strung totally, but. If you're not using them, like why keep them under constant tension? So we honor our bows by unstringing them when they're not in use. Okay, so this next bundle of bows um, are actually from, not this wood is actually not from here. This wood is, it's still from Turtle Island, but it's actually from Oklahoma. And it was sacredly harvested from a family out there who is um, Cherokee, who actually have been harvesting sacredly for thousands of years. So when this wood was harvested, um, it was brought to Oregon um, for bow making. And uh, yeah, I'm just, just, I'm just, I like to give that story so people know where it comes from. These are actually from here, the U, where this is actually not from here. But I, yeah, just wanted to show you some other species. This is called Osage, which is actually a tribe too. Um, and this has um, a snake skin on the back and this is a copperhead um, snake. And I have a few snake bows, but I just wanna take a quick second to talk about that. Um, I'm very aware that some tribes have a cultural stigma around having snake skins. So um, when I came to um, this place today, I, to my understanding that there were no snakes um, 
there was no stigma around the snakes, so I felt comfortable bringing them here. But, you know, as a bow maker, I feel like it's a good responsibility to check in with people before you actually start bringing these things, because you can offend other folks um, when you may not, that may not be your intention. So I just wanted to point that out as I'm going down the list of bows, there are other snakes. So if you're a viewer and you wish not to see that, um, just be aware that they are coming. So, Copperhead on Osage with a buffalo leather grip. Um, no string silences on this one. This one is also Osage. This is Corn Snake. And on the ends, I have some tip overlays that are a green box burl oak, and they're dyed and they're heat treated. And then rabbit fur for the string silencers. And then this is also a buffalo um, leather grip. This one's got a little bit of a recurve in there. This one's really fun to shoot. <laughs> cool. This one was really fun. Um, I didn't think I was gonna be able to make a bow out of this one. But if you look, oh. there's a hole coming right. That's where the arrow actually goes. So when we are shooting this, you put your arrow through here and you attach it to the string. And this is also Osage. Um, I just had some like little cute paint, little like white and uh, black dot designs. This also has a buffalo leather and maybe we'll shoot this later. Have a little bit of a turtle with the medicine wheel to represent all of our relations. Alright, so here is another Osage, and Osage species wood. Um, this one I painted. I think this is the first series that I'm going to show that is actual paint job. Um, I just used some acrylic paint on there, and generally I'll do one, two, three, four to honor the four directions, the four seasons, and um, sometimes I'll do seven points, make sure one, two, three, four, five, six, yep, seven, to honor our seven generations before us and the seven generations um, that will come after. So it's to honor them. This is generally how I do my paint designs. And uh, this is deer hide for the, for the leather handle. Yeah. I'm gonna unstring this one. Oh, Osage. You'd think that this looks like it's gonna break right here because it's like really bent up, but that's just how the wood was growing. And this right here, here is another copperhead um, rattlesnake. And if you see the design of the actual bow, it's much different than the others. This is actually how the wood grain was growing. And when you're working Osage in a lot of um, bows, or just a lot of wood, uh, when you're making bows, you have to follow the, um, the design that was put in there by Creator. If you try to violate that, you're violating the laws of nature and uh, it has its repercussions, which usually ends up in a broken bow. So try your best to follow the growth of the grain of the wood when you're making bows. And they look really cool when, they, when you're actually able to see that, but it takes a little bit of time. And yeah, this actually has otter fur on the string that was gifted to me by a person named Gray up in Montana. Yeah. Okay. Last of the Osage series is this bow. This is a pronghorn antelope. Um, I actually made this bow with the intention to hunt antelope off of my reservation down in Chilliquin at some point in my life. Um, this bow is very heavy and I did it with these colors to um, to kind of like help attract the, um, the pronghorn antelope um, when I actually go to hunt them. Um, they are very drawn to white colors. So um, hopefully this will be used for the harvest someday soon. This also has water So here is a bow. This is my first bow um, that I made with uh, complete uh, 
direction and instruction from a person named Tony Deland, who actually is a teacher here in Portland, Oregon. And he actually uh, works with Three Wild sometimes too, doing pottery and bow making and other things. Um, he helped me make this. Um, this isn't super traditional as these materials are not from here. Um, this is bamboo on the back side. And it's been wood glued together to hickory. Navajo artist named Geronimo Clark, he was able to put these bits of rawhide on here as he wanted to do a collaborative piece. And he said, hey, do you have a bow I can practice on? And I said, sure. And he, he put these on here, and these like really nice rawhide art pieces. And, um, yeah, it was really cool to do a little bit of uh, collaboration with another artist who's indigenous. And yeah, it's still, it's still this pretty heavy bow. I really don't like to shoot it just because I know it's really old and I don't want it to break. I like that it's still in one piece since it was one of my first ones. So this next um, selection of bows are called Black Locust. And Black Locust is also not from here. Um, as far as I know, it's from the East Coast. But it was brought over here by um, the people who were colonizing the West as they didn't have a barbed wire fence yet or that hadn't been invented and they were planting these types of trees because these trees have big thorns on their branches and they grow them really close together to keep in their cattle. Um, so, but then they, they grow very abundant and they love this area. So this type of tree grows everywhere now on the West Coast. Um, this bow is really special to me because it was the first bow that I could make that function that had deep knots running into the bow and not break. Um, this was like one of my, I think my fourth or fifth time trying to make a bow out of this wood, and it was really challenging, but you'll know that if you look right here, there are some compression fractures, and with locust, that's the type of wood this is, they will develop there if there's a weak spot where it's bending too much, it'll show you that it's weak there before it actually breaks by putting these little micro fractures in there. Um, so you want to make sure you get it bending evenly around the surrounding area before it actually breaks on you. So luckily this one withheld the this, this stand of time. So yeah, that one's nice. A couple of these are painted bows. This one is actually I made for a person named Jason Umtouch who does Fires Igniting a Spirit, which is a nonprofit, and they do a lot of donations running food and water and clothes and all kinds of things to people in need, especially uh, our indigenous community. So this is going to be for him to honor his people and his tribe. Um, yeah, and I'm excited for him to pick it up. And he gave me this paint design, uh, or this design, because the uh, one of his flags had similar colors. I just kind of added some of my own flair to it. So yeah, they're, they're always really fun to make. Cool. And then also a buffalo leather grip, you can see. This is generally what I put on my bows when I'm making them a custom for, for someone. Sweet. Moving on, here is another black locust bow. This one is just for fun. You see that there's a shelf on both sides where the arrow would rest when you're shooting it. Um, it was just for fun. I like to keep this around just to kind of like remember that, you know, uh, bow making doesn't always have to be like this like super serious thing all the time. Like just have fun with it, and some of the days, you know, honor it when you need to, but also like as soon as like, oh I'm just gonna like, kind of wing it and see what happens and you know, it's really fun. But I love the paint job on this one. Also using the acrylic on there. We have a couple more snakeskin bows. So um, on this black locust piece I made this one up in uh, Montana. This is a uh, timber rattlesnake, and it almost has like a purple hue to it. Purples and pinks, it's really cool. I have never seen this snake before, but I was gifted this snake skin by a friend named Gray, who also lives up in Montana. This is coyote fur, roadkill coyote. Put that on the handle. And then you have here, um, red tail hawk feather. And that, when I'm hunting, 
see how the wind's wanting to blow that way, it's going to let me know where my scent is being pulled. So if I want my deer to be that way. If they're downwind, and I'm like, if they're downwind from me, they're probably going to pick up on my smell. So even if you do descend there, they're really, really smart animals. So anyway, yeah, this is one of my hunting bows. I really, really love this bow. It's very hard to pull. It's about 60 pounds at 24 inches. And here, got another, we have our diamondback rattlesnake on this one. Um, this has um, otter fur right here. Actually, I think this is beaver, sorry. And then, yeah, just a diamondback running down the back of this black locust boo. fire hardened the belly right here. You, you haven't seen that on any of these other ones yet, but I um, use some heat to heat treat the belly to increase the strength of the bow. And it went from being like a 40 pound to like about a 48 to 50 pound bow, which was very good. And then I also have a wind feather on here to let me know where my, where my scent is. Okay. So here we have a different species of wood. This one is black or black walnut. This is my first go of doing this. I just did this at the very end of 2020, so about December. I was able to make this one. Um, very challenging, very sticky wood, I would say. Um, but really, really pretty. Much, much different than the, the rest of our other ones. Black walnut, that's my only one because I only have one. The rest of these are white woods, so meaning that the wood on the inside are white. This one is green ash, and green ash, um, I, I harvested this up in Montana uh, off of the Kootenai um, uh, territories up there, and this was my first go at it, and I just did this recently. So this one. So this one right here is uh, hazel. So this one is um, another white wood. It's a very tricky one to actually make a bow out of because if you notice right here, there are some like little lines in the wood if you can pick up on that. That's also kind of similar to the locust. They let you know if you're stressing the wood out too much in one certain spot. So usually they end up blowing but luckily I was able to kind of save it and work in areas where it wasn't bending and now it's a pretty decent bow. And I did acrylic on this one. This is probably, you can actually see the bark, the real bark is actually right here. And yeah, this is one of, not an easy bow wood to make, but they usually don't like to be hunting weight bows. Like they're good for kid bows. Um, this one's about hunting weight. I think it's like 38 pounds. Almost made the cut. But yeah. Next is going to be Oregon white ash. So not the green ash, but a white ash. And this is really, really pretty wood. I would imagine that many people actually use the ash tree because it grows so abundant here in Oregon and in Washington. Um, I would imagine that they had, I think it's a very underrated bow wood. This bow is actually about 55 pounds and 26 inches, which could hunt an elk. So um, I left the bark on this one. Uh, I don't normally leave bark on bows. Um, put that in the light a little bit. But yeah, and you can see that this bow has knots all up in it. And most people would be like, oh my gosh, like you want to try to find a knot, knot free piece of wood. Where with ash and some other bow woods, like, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you just really have to be in constant communication with the wood, letting you know that it's okay. Because um, I'll let you know when they're not. So. <laughs> uh, next is another piece of Oregon ash. This is without the bark. Let's see if we can do a little bit of a comparison contrast. What it looks like with the bark on and the bark off. Very vibrant. This one's also brand new. 
so you can tell how it oxidizes the wood down here. It's got a little bit more of a darker color where this one's got more, more of a potent white. So this is fresh. That stays pretty, pretty white, um, even as it gets a little bit older. But this one's really fun. Um, this will probably be one of the ones that we shoot today. Was actually harvested as a sapling from southern Oregon actually near the California border. Um, I was out there on a work retreat and we found a big orchard of just these oaks and I had never worked oak before so I made sure to grab me two and actually how I found this one as we were looking for them we're like where we want to find some oak to harvest you know like we, we found we heard that this place is really abundant and so I started actually getting bored looking for them and I started following these deer tracks. And as I followed the deer tracks, I found a deer rub on a sapling. And then I was like, oh, here it is. So it was just kind of a good reminder to just like, you know, not always, um, I don't know, put the intention of like, I have to find it, I have to find it. Just let it come to you naturally. And I think that, that the best things in life kind of happen that way. <laughs> All right. The next one we're going to do is Ocean Spray. Ocean Spray is actually more known for its arrow wood because um, it's a very, very hard and pliable wood because it grows like shoots. But sometimes when they get thick enough, you can use them for short bows. I've even seen them longer, but look at the grain. It's so amazing. I love the, like, it almost looks like a digital grain. I don't know how to explain it but it looks 2D or something like that. Just the way that it's got like these like hard choppy edges and it like runs out. It's very nice. But yeah, so this one is very, oh, people would think that this is a kid's bow. It's not. <laughs> It'll definitely hunt for sure. Woo. So yeah. And this wood also does the fretting too. And that's where they get the compression fractures. So you can see that there's some line, some lines right there. And uh, yeah, so hard, it's a hard one to make an actual like long-term bow out of. They're good for making like green bows to practice making them. Not for long-term. This is like probably the longest one I've had. <laughs> the break. We got two more. This one is uh, a relative from the East Coast. Uh, I think it might be from Minnesota, maybe somewhere else over there. But this is hickory. So hickory is probably one of the cooler woods because it has this crazy ripple grain running on the back side of the bow. <laughs> it's really, really neat. So you gotta be really careful taking the bark off because if you accidentally clip that ripple, it could violate the back side of the bow. And when you're making bows, you need it to either be, it needs to be on one single growth ring all the way through the back of the bow. Because if it's a chunk's taken out and you expose the ring underneath it, it'll blow right there and separate. And you don't want that. Because bows breaking on people are very scary. And this one has a little bit of a slight recurve to it. I just used steam, just dipped it in some steam and bent it over uh, a small round and let it stay like that until it cooled down and then it stays. And this also has silencers. This is um, also heat treated. You'll see the difference from this white to a bit of a uh, more like a like a coffee creamer brown. It's lots of creamer. <laughs> And then last but not least, this one is actually a very interesting piece. This is red osier dogwood. Um, yeah, most people would think that, oh, like that's like good for arrowwood 
and things like that. Um, you can, it's used for all types of different things and it's found in like wetland areas and on like river banks and things like that. But yeah, I left the bark on the handle and it kind of looked like a little bit of like a bone or like some type of rune. <laughs> I just wanted to be like that. But yeah, this one, this also has one recurve and one knot. That was not intentional. This was just how the, it was bent. And I just got lazy and didn't recurve the other one, I guess. But this is what nature did. It came like this. I was just like, I don't know. I didn't want to risk breaking it, trying to, do, trying to match it. So yeah, that is the red osier dogwood. So here I have some um, traditional arrows that I made this past year um, for hunting white-tailed deer in Montana. Um, I wanted to just go over some of the um, specs, you could call them, um, some of these um, items. Here I have, uh, this is a Montana agate um, off the like, Kootenai Salish areas. Um, up kind of near Missoula, and this shaft, the type of wood is called mock orange. I don't know the native name for it, but it's a very, it's very close, it's like pretty hard, um, like ocean spray in terms of its density, but it can still bend a little bit, which you want when you are designing a good arrow. And then it's lashed on with ponderosa pine pitch from southern Oregon and then elk sinew bound around that to additionally hold it in place. So there's no super glue or anything like that I'm used to making this. And then you have acrylic paint for this. And then up top for the fletching, we have um, also uh, just a little bit of hide glue with elk sinew. But this is backstrap sinew because we want it really not long pieces to weave around the fletching uh, of the arrow. And the fletching, the reason that this is here is to help steer the arrow because when the arrow is flying, it's not flying perfectly straight. It's slightly bending, and so these will keep it on its flight path where you want it to go. If it doesn't have these, sometimes your arrow will kind of drift. So these fletchings keep it keep it in place. Just to talk about that. And then, so this was actually, this is Snowy Owl that was a roadkill. So I use, I pick up a lot of roadkill. I'm trying to honor it as much as possible because it's not the animal's fault that they get hit by big trucks and cars. So when I see it and it feels good, I'll pick it up and I'll use it to, to honor it. So this was Snowy Owl. And um, yeah, we're gonna, gonna use this one. This is the first time I used it. It's the quietest arrow I've ever used. Traditionally, some people use them for not so good things while um, owl fletching, so that's also something to be aware of. Owls in general is another cultural stigma. So um, I came with the intention to to put some deer blood on the white of this. I have yet to do that. <laughs> um, so these are for the animals, not for war party or assassination, which traditionally some owl feathers are used for. So good to take note of that. This is snowberry. Um, snowberry is also another traditional arrowwood that was used amongst the areas here. Um, yep, you can tell that this one got used quite a bit. The paint is running off, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. So yeah, here we have a jasper. I believe this one is from Oregon. Um, my buddy Gray actually made this one. Um, it's very beautiful. I love the orange tone crossing it against the green. It's very cool. Also ponderosa pine pitch with um, elk sinew lashed. Acrylic, obviously this is a snowberry shaft. Um, and then up here we actually have more elk sinew and hide glue lashing down. These are turkey vulture fletchings. And then you can see the knock is just the piece that um, we, uh, that needs to fit onto the string, and we just, we do that very simply using like a small rough file to get those out. And you could use a stone to do it too, it's pretty neat. And then last but not least, we have some of these are, oh, yeah, I'm just gonna use this one. This 
on. Um, this is ocean spray. Or no, 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 this is a viburnum. Oh, viburnum is a different species. It's kind of like, it's almost, as, I think it's about as far as ocean spray. Um, but it's the East Coast relative. Um, so this came from, I think it was Vermont. I had a buddy um, up there who harvested some. And this is a polka dot agate from Oregon. Um, this actually comes from the south down in southern Oregon, which is also has the same pine pitch elk sinew laced around there, um, acrylic paint, and then it goes all the way up to the top. And these are red tail hawk tail feathers. And I have one that is red for the color, the fletching that faces away from the bow, and these other two are darker pigment. So that's kind of a style thing. It's not a super traditional method, but I thought that that would look really cool. But I'll show you a couple different ones. This one is also one red and two darker tail feathers of the red tail hawk. And then I'll show you one that's all red. And then this one doesn't have any barring but it's still red tail hawk. And a good giveaway of these like little black bars at the very tippy tops of the ends of the feathers on the tail. You can see that this one has it too, just very faintly. All right, <laughs> Josh here, um, Joshua Hood, Modoc, and Pasquayaki. And here uh, we're gonna be doing a very basic outline for how to create a traditional bow. Um, Traditional bow, um, just meaning that we are using um, very traditional techniques and methods and materials to craft something that can hunt um, or target shoot or protect your home. So here we have uh, a wooden bow and we're going to try to craft something like this in a basic design out of a stave and a stave meaning just a, a large piece of wood that is soon to be turned into a bow. And the material selection that we have today is organ ash. And the reason that I'm using organ ash is that it's very readily available. They grow um, in large numbers in wetland areas. And they, like you can literally like, for me, in the spots that I know, um, I'll cut one and then as soon as I come back, like maybe six months to a year later, there's like way more. So it's almost like you're helping the ecosystem, but I highly encourage those who are not from the land, who are non-indigenous to seek other methods for this um, style of harvesting because over harvesting is a thing. And when you're constantly um, over harvesting, it really doesn't allow for the people Actually trying to reconnect to their heritage and their traditional lifestyles. Um, it just doesn't leave a lot of room for it. So, yeah, I would uh, encourage you to seek different methods, and this is not a platform to teach you how to do that. So, um, with this, Dave, um, we're gonna actually wanted to show you some very basic tools that we're using and talk about the old tools and just some of the more contemporary and modern tools. So, we have a measuring tape. Uh, believe it or not, people used different ways to measure in North America. People are like, oh yeah, you just kind of eyeballed it. Like, no, we had systems to measure. So we have a measuring tape for now. We have a carving knife, single bevel, and we have a hatchet. Traditionally what's used in bow making is what's called an adze. And instead of the blade facing sideways, the blade would face this direction and slightly tilted so you could like scoop out materials of the bow and you also use that for boat making and all kinds of things and then a rasp right a rasp is just an aggressive tool to reduce uh material off of the wood um but traditionally what's used is like an aggressive stone right so and then we have um our pencil <laughs> which is charcoal so yeah and that's going to be making our markings for how long the stave is and kind of figuring out where our handle section is going to be and more. So, 
So when you have your sapling or your stave carved out, um, you're going to want to find something that's called center line, right? It's basically finding a straight line down the entirety of the piece of wood that the string is going to set in there. So I'm going to draw a line from this end going down the other end, choosing the best route that I think would make for a bow design. So I'm just gonna run it all, and this is also a good way to mark, to not chop into the side of the bow that you want to be your bow, because one side has to be untouched, the other side has to be, uh, is gonna be the side that we're reducing from. So this is also a good way to set a reminder to not touch this part of the bow. Boom, just like that. So that's our center line. Next, what we're gonna do is measure how long this is to mark our handle section. So we're gonna go with our handy dandy ruler. Or I mean, measuring tape. There's 64 inches. Let me double check. 64. So we're gonna do 32. Okay, so we're gonna make a mark right there at 32 inches. And now, depending on how big you're, you can kind of zoom up on here, you can like, from here, you can actually eyeball it. So I have this cross section for my center line and where the center of the actual bow is gonna be. You could go, you know, you could outline your hand um, but what I'm going to do, just for a rule of thumb, is I'm going to do two inches on this side and two inches right here. So I'll have a four inch grip and then you add one inch outside of that for what's called a fade. And just to kind of put a bow side by side so you can illustrate what's here is you have the section for where your hand is going to be. And then if I flip this, you'll see that there's a little bit of a slope. This one inch section right here is the slope called the fade, which fades into the working part of the limbs of the bow. So now that we have our center line and our handle area established, we can start reducing material using some type of chopping tool. Again, it was traditionally used as an adze. Or if it were a larger piece, people would split the wood with antler wedges or wooden wedges and then use a bopping stick to split it in half to save some calories because this is a lot of work. So what I'm going to do with this hatchet, um, which is the more uh, modern way to doing this, um, but not the most modern, uh, is I'm going to just start reducing wood on the area that's going to be what's called the belly of the bow. I want to leave the back of the bow untouched for right now. And so the way I'm going to do that is just slowly start chopping. So that's pretty good. So I've done one side. I don't know if it's the top limb or the bottom limb yet. We, we don't decide that in the beginning. So I'm going to flip this and start working the other side. And what I'm going to do is make sure it's all lined up where I want it. I want to make sure it's nice and flat when I'm doing this. I don't want it to be cutting and twisting on the sides and looking like a, um, I forget what those things are called. They're like a barber shop, like spiral thing. We don't want any of that action going on. We want it to be nice and flat. So I'm going to do that going down this area. So if you look down it, it's got a little bit of a twist that's twisting off on this side. So I'm going to correct that by taking off this corner. It's nice and flat. It's pretty close, <laughs> but these are, this is in the very rough stages. So now that I have that, I'm going to keep doing that until it starts to bend a little. And there's no way this is bending right now. So we'll check in in a minute when I have this all 
uh, chop down and bending. Okay, so we got it mostly flat. It's got a little bit of a propeller twist, but we're gonna fix that in a minute. But my next step is, check this out, it's, it is bending. Ooh. But we don't want it to bend too much because I want this to be potentially a hunting weight boat. That's always my goal, um, personally. Um, but if it doesn't, then there's lots of kids who like boats, so. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna do now is, we don't wanna just cut knocks and try to put a string on this when it's that thick. We want there to be a nice taper going from the widest section towards the handle all the way to the end, right? So we're gonna remove all of this, but I need to draw a guideline just to make sure I don't take too much off. So I'm gonna use my handy dandy pencil, AKA the jerkle, and we're gonna just kinda draw a little bit of a, a gentle taper. And we're gonna reduce those sides. We're gonna do the same thing on the other side. That's where I want it. So from here, it's leading up to this knot, which should be fine. Okay, so I'm gonna reduce these sides to start it to actually making it look like a bow. <laughs> Boom. Nice and thin compared to big old Balaki. So hit this side real quick. So these ends gotten the tips and of the limbs um, pretty tapered out. Um, there's still a little bit of a twist, but that's actually not a terrible thing. Um, like I said, we're just making this one on the fly. Um, but yeah, it's looking pretty good. Let's check the bend. One other thing in bow making is you want to avoid what's called a hinge. And a hinge is, is exactly what it sounds like, like a point where it looks like a door hinge, right? You want to try to get the material that you're reducing to be an even amount through the entire course of the bow. Now, some people will use like calipers to measure, where traditionally you just use your fingers, just like close your eyes and like feel it, and you see it, right? There's a lot of different things going on. So it's looking pretty good. Um, I also don't hear any noises, like any cracking or ticking, so that means that we're on the right go. So now what we're gonna do is remove the bark. So that's pretty simple. All I'm gonna need for that is, you could use a carving knife and just carve it all off, but today I'm actually gonna use a draw knife just because it goes really quick and there's nothing to it. So I'm gonna angle the bow like this and I'm just gonna peel the spark off nice and gently. And what I want, what I don't want to do is cut into my actual wood. I just want to get to the very first growth ring um, of the wood. I don't want to go any deeper than that. So I'm being very like careful when I'm doing this to not go through the actual bow. And I had mentioned it before in the bow um, video when I was talking about um, I forget which bow it was, but the bow, on the back of the bow, the part that faces away from you when you shoot, has to be on one single growth ring um, all the way through or else it'll break. Um, because it's under a lot of tension and any weak point on the bow will cause it to almost explode on you. So we don't want any of that. So that's about it right there. 
and I'll flip it and I'll hit the other end and you don't need to see that. So we'll see you when it's done. <laughs> the bark off the back of the bow. It's looking pretty okay. Like it's still very rough, right? So I wanna try to get this finished up pretty quick. So I'm gonna do the handle a little bit. So it actually looks like a, a bow cause that's a really big handle. Uh, and then I'm gonna carve some knocks and try to put a string on it and see what happens. So let me just start working this handle really quick. I'm going to put some relief cuts going one direction. And then I flip it and I'm gonna put relief cuts going this direction. And it's important to go back and forth because if you just go one direction, you're gonna go right into the wood. So it's important to go a little bit of back and forth. Do a little bit more on this one. You could also use a rasp to get in there and like really clean it up. But we're just doing just the bays and the bay minimum, just to get it to be more a little bit more comfortable in the hand, and so the arrow is not bonking off of the handle, having it be so large. And you've been noticing that when I've been using this hatchet or most of the tools, except for the draw knife, I'm always carving away from myself. Um, I'm not also not doing like huge swings because like when I was chopping on here, I had my hand mostly up here. I just want to talk about safety for a sec rather than going through and then landing it in your leg, right? So just be aware of taking it slow, thinking about the path of your blade making sure you don't end up in the hospital or worse. I know a lot of friends like to make these out while they're camping and stuff, so I'm sure you're hydrated <laughs> at the very least when I'm doing stuff like this. Okay, so we got one sun, boom. Get the center sun. Okay, almost there. Now we're gonna carve some rocks. Okay, so now we have something that looks a little bit more like a handle, right? Like I said, I'll probably clean this up later when I am not at the plank house. But you get an overall idea that we gotta skip this little section out or else that arrow when it wraps around or tries to wrap around the bow, it's not gonna bonk off and maybe land in your neighbor's yard or something. I don't want that. Cool. So we've made a lot of progress in a short amount of time. Now what we want to do is carve some knocks, which are these little grooves that the string's gonna fit in. So I'm gonna make these a little bit thinner down here, and then we're gonna start chopping into the wood to make the knocks. Because if there's a lot of wood on the very tips, it's going to slow the speed of your arrow down significantly. So the thinner the tips, the better, but make sure that it's not too weak up there that it's going to hinge or something weird like that. Good. Use a little charcoal. Draw where I'm gonna carve, 
cut my knocks. And you want your knocks to be pointing down towards the belly of the bow. Just like that. I'm do this other side. And you do it just about maybe like a little less than an inch from the top. Okay. Now I'm just gonna use my knife to actually carve these out. It's my wood carving knife. You can use like a like a round rasp or things like that when you got them. But right now I don't have those, so I'm gonna do what's called scoring. Meaning I made a line here and a line here. I'm gonna scoop up. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's looking good. Looking like a pretty rough notch, but it looks like it might hold a string. In the end, you really wanna make sure these are all smooth and sanded, but right now we're just making it, making it work. Oh yeah. Okay. And actually, traditionally, some bows were made with just one knock. The reason behind that, I, I have some theories, but I don't wanna talk out of my butt. So <laughs> I think that one reason is that they could string their bow faster, because if you only have to worry about getting your loop on one side rather than both and making sure it's secured, you're gonna have, yeah, it's just easier to do it that way. And I think it's just a lot faster. So that is my thought on it. Um, sometimes the limbs aren't always straight, so it can correct a twist in the limb if you just do one knock on one side and maybe two on the other. I've done that before, but I don't know if that's traditionally like why it has been done. Um, but yeah. Okay, so we have the knocks that we carved on the very tips and the ends. So now we're gonna see how it's bending. Um, I did like a little bit of a rough out to uh, get it to be balanced, but just to show you kind of what that looks like. It looks pretty good. This side, I don't know. Seems pretty good actually. It's maybe bending a little bit too much up here. So from here, um, you would use that rasp to then start getting a lot of these um, chop marks out. So I just tied a basic timber hitch on one end, and now I'm going to try to string the bow. As you can see, this limb is bending more when I'm trying to string it. So what that tells me is I need to produce a little bit more throughout here. And I can do that really quickly with just the hatchet very methodically. If I really wanted to make this a killer bow, I could fire harden it actually right next to the fire torch the belly of the bow, which would be super cool. It changes the hardness of the wood fibers so that the compression of the wood cells are not under so much stress. It would create a better performing bow. Now. 
See how it's still bending a little bit too much there? So what I can do right now is I can either unstring it or I can leave it strung. If it were bending a lot, I would take the string off. And what I can do is I can take this and start to get it to match that other one. Bit by bit. Day by day, not by minute. I'm gonna give it a little check to see how it's bending. You can clearly see this is still bending a bit more. Oh yeah. So what I might actually do is unstring it, work in here, and I think it'll even it out. Okay, so let's see how it's bending now. Mm. Ooh, much better. Oh, now this one's bending more. If you get the picture, you're going to get, so the art of bow making, shaping it, getting a center line, all those things are very critical, but the most important is trying to get the tiller right. And the tiller is getting both limbs to bend evenly with each other. So it's a harmonious relationship in one piece. So I'm going to leave you with that um, as I need a little bit more work to do here. But honestly, like if I wanted to, I could probably just go shoot this right now. Um, and this string right here, I just had like some thick string. You could use like parachute string or just some type of rope, anything that'll won't like snap on you, something strong. But anyway, um, that is the basics of just doing a traditional wooden bow with just some tools in about under an hour. So I'm gonna leave you with that. But with that all said, Sapketcha for joining us and we'll see you next time. Sweet, I just wanna say Sapketcha. Yeah.